Friends, I want to talk about the church a little bit like Phil just did in the morning session. Historically, in the early church, there was a great concern to understand what a church is. In 8381, at the Council of Constantinople, the pastors gathered together there affirmed that we believe in, and some of you will know these four markers they came up with, one holy, universal, and apostolic church. And these four marks have been used as defining the church, uh, as defining marks. One, that is there's one church ultimately that we're all a part of, the assembly of our Lord Jesus Christ. This church is marked by holiness. That is, we are set apart from the world. We're distinct from the world. We are universal. That is, we're the same everywhere. So whatever may be the difference between a church in LA and a church in Togo, West Africa, all of the most important things about this church and that brother's church are the same. Because it is the nature of the church to be universal in that sense. And apostolic. Uh, not in terms of succession, of oily hands to oily head at ordination from the first apostles down. Not apostolic in that sense. That is a, a meaningless sense of the word apostolic. If you think that because something is older, it must be truer, look at all the errors combated in the first century epistles in the New Testament. There are lots of false practices in Christian churches that can date back 2,000 years. It doesn't make them good because they're old. It has to be consistent with the apostles' teaching. So apostolic in terms of teaching. So one holy, universal, and apostolic. Then, as Phil told us, at the Reformation, the question came up again in a pressing way, what constitutes a true church? And Phil gave us a very good rehearsal of the two or three marks that Christians looking at their Bibles came up with regularly, which is the right preaching of the Word of God, the right administration of the sacraments of baptism and the Lord's Supper, and the practice of church discipline, which is implied in the right administration of the Lord's Supper. So in this session together this afternoon, I'm suggesting less a complete ecclesiology. So this is not a lecture in the doctrine of the church. I'm talking to other pastors, trying to think what is healthy? What, what, what do you want to see in your church that makes it a sound church, uh, a prospering church? If you want to think more about a whole ecclesiology, I wrote a book a few years ago called The Church, uh, The Gospel Made Visible. They may have copies of it in the bookstore. Uh, You could could get that, but that's not what I'm doing in this session. So just to pull the camera back out, let's start with God himself. He is self-existing. No one created God. God, in his amazing kindness, uh, created everything. And so here we are. He has revealed himself to those of us made in his image so that we understand more about what he's like. He's revealed himself supremely in Christ. But he also reveals the truth about himself in our life together as a local church as we reflect his character. So because of the fall of Adam, we read about in Genesis 3 and uh, Genesis 2 and 3 and Romans 5, we understand that we are all under God's just condemnation because of our sin, because of Adam's sin. Therefore, we need help from God if we are to have the kind of life he's made us to have. And that would be through the Holy Spirit giving us the gift of revealing the truth, like we were thinking about last night from Matthew 16, where divine and supernatural light revealed to Peter the truth about who Jesus is. And we need to be regenerated. We need to be born again so that we can be restored to that initial calling of creation to reflect the Creator. So what we're about in our individual lives as Christians, but also in our local churches, is reflecting the character of God to His creation. That's a wonderful calling. What a great thing to be called to do. So dear brother, if you're you're an under-shepherd, if you're an elder in a local church... This is what you're trying to to help along in your local church. Now, if you look around at churches today, here in the United States, let's say, at churches that call themselves Christian churches, you'll find a, a number of different ideas of how to best do this. You'll find different streams of churches. Let's say you have your kind of liberal churches. 
And let's say you have your sort of seeker sensitive churches. Let's say you have your prosperity churches. And let's say you have your kind of traditional evangelical churches. Let me just take those four as examples. The liberal churches, I mean Schleiermacher, uh, mainline Protestantism, believing that the real truth of Christianity is the subjective experience. It's not historical facts. It's just us feeling dependent on God. That's the way Schleiermacher, a great German liberal philosopher and theologian, talked about it in the 1700s, early 1800s. For seeker-sensitive, uh, the great prophets would be how we reflect God best. It's going to be Bill Hybels and Rick Warren. Uh, those would be the, the two guys who said, listen, we, we will do a better job reflecting the character of God if we are better at winning non-Christians. And to do that, we need to be more sensitive to them in the way we think through our local churches. The prosperity tradition is, uh, is personified by someone like a Joel Osteen who will use a lot of traditional biblical and Christian language, but with pretty radically different meanings. And the traditional evangelical churches around us, we could use uh, the example of the, of the recently dearly departed Billy Graham, uh, you know, who himself uh, preached that people should repent of their sins and trust in the saving work of Christ. Well, what's interesting to me about all these four traditions, if you were to interview them, they're all trying to be evangelistic. They're all trying to reach the world. Uh, Schleiermacher wrote his famous lectures to the cultured despisers of religion. He was trying to rescue what he understood to be the germ of Christianity from all the things which it was being despised for by the intellectuals of his day. The secret sensitive movement is obviously evangelistic in its intent. They're trying to reach people. Joel Osteen would say the same, and the prosperity preachers would say the same. And certainly that's what traditional evangelicals have been. In many ways, the evangelistic outreaches of traditional evangelical churches have been a lot like seeker-sensitive stuff, only an older variety. So instead of having a rock band, we'll have a women's trio sing. But the idea is we'll do something that a non-Christian would like to hear, and they'll come in, and that's how we will reach them with the gospel. I would just like to raise a question about all of these kinds of varieties. In the liberal church, it's very success-directed. That is, it assumes that if they will just be relevant enough, you'll be able to tell because immediately you'll see the fruit with people coming into their churches. Well, if that's true, it seems like there hasn't been a lot of obvious fruit in those churches. Seeker-sensitive, the same thing. It's very success-directed. Uh, their whole argument it seems to be premised on the thought that if we get this right, we'll know because then people will come in. Uh, the prosperity gospel churches would be very similar. Uh, they want to see large crowds. They're directed by visible relevance and apparent fruit. But friends, I think with this fourth category of traditional evangelical, we have to say there's a lot of similarity in our thinking. In traditional evangelical churches, I think the assumption often is if you just get it right in the outreach, the people will come in. The church will grow. And what I would like to say about all of these, though there are definitely different weaknesses among them, they're all for success directed. And there are a couple of problems with that. One, in an increasingly secular culture, people are living cognitively further and further away from the Christian gospel. Uh, like I think I said in some conversation, maybe in the one we had up here yesterday, that the nominalism that seemed more typical 30 years ago in America is being replaced, I often feel, with a more overt hostility to the gospel. But even beyond just our particular situation we're in right now, theologically, ever since the fall of Adam, people have been spiritually dead. The only way anybody ever responds to the gospel is by the supernatural work of the Holy Spirit. So we have to allow for what you could call the Judson factor. You know, Adoniram Judson, the 19th century missionary who went to Burma, worked with the Karens, and saw no converts after a year of laboring there. Uh, none after two years of laboring there. After three, he still had no converts. He had been there four full years. Think of where you were four years ago. 
He'd been there four years and nobody was converted. Five years and no conversions. Six years and no conversions. It was in his seventh year that one person he saw was converted. Now, if you go on and you read Judson's story, I think God used him tremendously. I think he's faithful and, in God's eyes, successful. But I don't think a lot of us, in the way we look at our churches, allow for that kind of Judson factor of a long faithfulness that's not immediately, apparently fruitful. So I think we need another model Instead of success, we need to be faithfulness directed, almost regardless of apparent success. And it's in that context that I want to encourage you to think about these marks of a healthy church, and especially the one we've already mentioned here uh, at this conference, and it's always mentioned here, which is one of the reasons I love this conference, the mark of expositional preaching. So if I'm going to give you, let's say, nine of these marks of a healthy church, The one I want to press on you most, but I'm going to spend the least time on because I think we're all agreed on this, is expositional preaching. Preaching which makes the point of the passage of Scripture the point of the message that you preach. That's what your people need to hear. If you want to have a healthy church, they need God's Word. We know from Romans 10, 17 that life comes by hearing the message of Christ, and it always has. Uh, I've told the story many times of being at a think tank in Washington, D.C., when uh, the new biography of, of uh, William Tyndale had come out um, by David Daniel. If you've not read it, it's a great biography. David T- Daniel is the author. The biography is just called William Tyndale. It's about his life. <clears throat> and a, a guy was standing next to me who had just read it. I had just read it. I was about to go give a, a sort of paper on it at a conference. He had just written a review of it for our local newspaper in D.C. And I said, so, Rob, what would you think of it? He said, oh, it was an okay book. He said, it's, except it had that typical Protestant squint. He was a Roman Catholic. He knew I was a Baptist pastor. But he said, it had that typical Protestant squint. And I thought, oh, what do I do? What do I do? I said, okay, so, well, Rob, what, what, what do you mean? Oh, you know, he participated in that myth that the Bible creates the church. When we all know the church created the Bible. Well, what was I to do? I mean... <laughs> I was his guest. It was his think tank. On the other hand, I was a pastor. I didn't really care if he ever invited me back. And, you know, he was being kind of flippantly contradictory to me. And so I thought I could do the same thing back to him. So I just said, Rob, that's ridiculous. God's people have never made God's word. God's word has always made God's people. From Genesis 1, when God speaks and the worlds are created, to Genesis 12, when his word of promise comes and Abraham and hearing and believing, he's created as God's people to Exodus 20 and to 24, when the word comes, the Ten Commandments, the nation of Israel is created as God's special people, to the vision of the valley of the dry bones in Ezekiel, where God's word comes and the people come alive in this vision, to supremely John 1, the word comes. To Romans 10, 17, faith comes by hearing the message about Christ. I said, Rob, God's people have never made God's word. God's word has always made God's people. That's, that's the pattern of all of history. Friends, we need to know that in our preaching. The church is created by God's word being preached. When we preach expositionally, we learn more than we set out to learn. We are reformed, reshaped, refashioned by God's word regularly. It teaches us a kind of humility, which is important for us as we learn, and it's important for us to model to our people as we humble ourselves before God's word. Well, enough on that. Expositional preaching, fundamental to us having healthy churches. A second thing, you do want to have particularly a theology that is biblical and especially of the gospel. You want to teach your people to cherish sound theology. That's a good and right thing because you don't simply want somebody who will preach expositionally, they say, the Jehovah's Witness you talk to will tell you that they're believing the Bible. You want someone who actually gets it right, who understands what the Bible says. I had a couple come up to me once after church and just say, uh, Mark, thank you for teaching us that God is God. They've been on vacation. They've been to a couple of other just sort of generic evangelical churches, which they were not encouraged by on the Lord's Day. And they just appreciated that as we looked at the Bible and our messages, it was clear that God is high and lifted up. He is sovereign and glorious. 
He is to be revered and worshipped. We have to be very careful in our preaching not to make God over in our own image. It makes a lot of difference, brother preacher, what you think the Bible teaches about sin, about grace, about substitution. These great doctrines need to be clear as you expound Scripture. So expound Scripture, yes, and as you do it, always have an eye to these great truths, especially the truths that are at the heart of the Bible's theology, the truths of the good news about Jesus Christ. Make sure you are clear in teaching what God is like. Do not fail to point out human sin and neediness and helplessness as you preach. Be crystal clear on Jesus Christ, on who He is, the sinless Son of God incarnate, humbling Himself, and on what He's done, died as a substitute bearing God's wrath for the sins of all of those that would ever repent of their sins and trust in Him. And God raised Him from the dead for our justification. And he ascended to heaven where he presented his sacrifice to his heavenly father who accepted it. Those things need to be clear. And you must then press the people in your hearing to repent of their sins. Use that imperative verb, repent, and to trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, to believe in him, to have faith in him. Implore those people in your hearing to do that as you preach. What you want to show in your preaching is that the gospel of Jesus Christ is not an additive that will help you make the life that you have better. That's how a lot of evangelistic appeals go. You've got a great life. I have something that could make it better. You have a wonderful life. Wouldn't you also like more sense of purpose? Let me give you a sense of purpose. You see here in the Bible, God has a purpose for your life. Wouldn't you like that? Well, friends, that may be how some modern evangelicals present the gospel, but that's weak stuff compared to how the Bible does it. The Bible tells us that our house that we're in is burning down. And whether or not you feel interested right now, you better be. Because God is going to demand an accounting from every person in the hearing of my voice. And every time you preach, that note of clarity and urgency needs to be there if you're going to have the gospel and the theology of the Bible clear. Let me give you a third thing you want to see grow in your church, and that's a particularly clear biblical understanding of conversion and evangelism. These two things are so closely related together. The Bible teaches that conversion is worked in our souls by by the regenerating Spirit of God. Have you seen that clearly? Uh, Let's go to Acts 11. You know when Peter is telling the others about what happened at Cornelius' house? It's a a precious report of early days of gospel spreading. So Peter, having been in Cornelius' house, seeing this great move of the Spirit of God, when Luke is recording this in Luke chapter, in uh, Acts chapter 11, verse 18, he records the response of the other apostles, the other Christians there. He says, uh, Acts chapter 11, verse 18, when they heard these things, they fell silent. Oh, that would be different in the evangelical church, wouldn't it? Why don't we have some times for silence? Where we're not trying to create a bunch of noise or make sure there's never any dead space in the service so people don't lose attention. Let's just have quietness before the Almighty God. Let's consider the kavoth, the glory, the weight of what it is that we're about. And then they glorified God, saying, Then to the Gentiles also, God has granted repentance that leads to life. God has granted repentance. It's his gift. Just like in Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, we see that faith is a gift of God. We need to be clear. I think evangelicals in the last century have forgotten that. Our language has changed from the clear and unapologetic language of the 19th century evangelicals when they would talk unapologetically about our need to be saved. In the 20th century, we started talking about making a decision. Or maybe if we were really strong about it, making a commitment. But friends, that's stuff you and I can do. Be saved is a wonderful image of us being lost at sea, for example, and we cannot save ourselves. 
We have to be saved. Someone else has to do it. That's what we need if we're going to present clearly the Bible's teaching on conversion and evangelism. I think because so many of our churches have been mistaught on this point or have misunderstood it, that means that there have been many churches that have a good number of people in their membership even who have made a sincere commitment at one point in their lives but who evidently have not experienced the radical change which the Bible presents as being born again or conversion. Our churches, by our sloppy evangelistic methods, have been filled with non-Christians, everybody being sincere. Nobody has ill intent in this except Satan. And because of that, the churches are weak and their witness is poor. Friends, please be clear and teach your people. We can and must freely give the good news. But we cannot convert someone. We cannot create Christians. Or if we do speak of our converting somebody, we're using a kind of ellipsis of meaning. It's, yes, they were converted because I shared the gospel with them, but theologically, if you press me, I understand that I could not so urge any non-Christian as to cause God to give them the gifts of repentance and faith. I share the gospel and God the Holy Spirit in His grace picks it up and uses it. Now, I I should just say from traveling around the country, different parts of the country are different about this. Out here on the West Coast, there's a great skepticism in many people to the idea of church membership at all. Back East, where membership is much more accepted, it's often terribly abused. So in our own membership class, I was listening to one of the other elders teach it a couple of weeks ago. And they mentioned how back in the 1930s, our church had over 3,000 members. Well, our building was no bigger then than it is now. I mean, if you're 1930s skinny, we can fit 1,000 of you in the building. You know, maybe maybe 1,100, I don't know. But there were 3,000 members. Well, what did that mean? We had no larger building. We didn't have multiple services. Well, it just meant they didn't really take membership very seriously. People would just walk down the aisle at the end of a song, they would be declared a member, and they would just keep a long list of these people who had done that, and they'd count up the number of them. And that number is what mattered, not the individuals. It was that there were this number of people. Friends, I think if a church's membership is markedly larger than its attendance, we want to ask what kind of evangelism has been practiced that would result in such a large number of people who are uninvolved in the life of the church and yet consider their membership in good standing as an evidence of their own salvation. Friends, we need to be clear in our evangelism. You need to teach your people to be clear in their evangelism that the gospel and responding to the gospel is costly and it's urgent and it's completely worth it. You gotta have all three of those things in there. Don't neglect the cost. Don't neglect the urgency. And don't let them think it's not worth it. It's glorious. It's wonderful. Present that clearly a biblical understanding of conversion and evangelism. A fourth thing that will help your church is a biblical understanding of church membership. When you clarify what it means to be a member of the church, you will help non-Christians. Non-Christians around you need to know what it means to be a Christian, and the thing that is supposed to show them that is the local church, and particularly those people who are members of the local church. If you really want to help those non-Christians, work on the membership of your church. It's really good for weak Christians, too. You know, if, if you want to say that, well, I don't, I don't need to be, a, I've, had, I've been told this more than once, I don't really need to be a member of the church, Mark, because, you know, I'm, I think I understand how to follow Christ. I'm, I'm happy to come here and hear your preaching, but, you know, I don't think I really need that. Well, I think such a person is blinded by their own pride. But rather than telling them, dear friend, I think you're blinded by your own pride. I might, in my own mind, mockingly and lovingly, I can mock and love at the same time, I might mockingly and lovingly speak to them condescendingly without hopefully them perceiving my condescension, though I realize I can smell of it sometimes. And I would just say, oh, but friend, there are Christians here who are not as strong as you. There are weak Christians who would need the help of someone like yourself. So even if not for your own sake, because obviously you you don't need that, but for others who haven't achieved the kind of maturity you've achieved, maybe you would commit yourself to try to love them and to try to help them. I had a friend once when I was studying abroad 
who was a very godly person in many ways, great memorizer of the Bible, good one-on-one evangelist, he would come to the same church I came to, I was a member of, I was an elder at, but he would only come in time for the sermon. And I asked him one time, I said, why do you just come in time for the sermon? Why don't you come like for the, the singing and the praying and the scripture reading and before that? He said, oh, I don't really get anything out of that. Okay. I said, have you ever thought of joining the church as a member? And he looked at me like I had three heads. He said, join the church? He said, why would I join the church? He said, I know what I'm here to do. I'm here to evangelize and disciple. He said, if I lock arms with all these people, they're just going to slow me down. Well, friend, you should hear that as charitably as you can. I have great respect for this man I'm telling the story about. He's a very godly man in some ways. But I think he had a bad misunderstanding. So all I said to him at the time, and I said it fairly quietly but clearly, I said, brother, I think you might find if you locked arms with all those people, they might slow you down, but you might help to speed them up. And God might care more about the whole than just about you as an individual. And you know, he, by God's grace, he understood that. And he ended up joining our church and becoming a very fruitful member of the church. Friends, I think we have to get past our American individualistic mindset of thinking it's all just about me and realize God actually cares about this congregation as a whole. And there might be things at my stage of life, at my spiritual maturity, with whatever finances I have, whatever urgency in prayer, that God could really use in the lives of some other people in the church. So join, join your local church for the sake of the weaker Christians that you could help. For that matter, join your local church for the sake of stronger Christians. You know, if, if you want to present good models of what it looks like to follow Christ, join a local church. Join a local church for the sake of the leaders of the church. How do I know who to pray for if I just have a bunch of visitors every Sunday? Uh, uh, who's going to pay for me? Who's going to pray for me? Who's going to commit themselves to be in this work if they don't let me know that they are here and let us know? You won't have any 50-year ministries like John MacArthur's if there's nobody who will commit themselves to the local church to have it built on. Friends, you join a local church ultimately for the glory of God. Your people listening to you preach don't know any of this stuff by nature. You have to teach this. You have to work to understand this yourself and then make it clear. You also, as a part of this, but pushing a little further, and again, Phil mentioned it this morning, number five, you need to have and teach a biblical understanding of church discipline. Now, if this is a new idea for you, I'm not going to take a lot of time and press this right now, but the roots of it are found in the teaching of Jesus. If you go over to Matthew's gospel, not chapter 16, where we were last night, but go over a couple of chapters to chapter 18. The whole chapter in Matthew 18 is about forgiveness for sins. How many times do I forgive? What does forgiveness look like? But there's this very interesting section in the middle of it, Matthew chapter 18, beginning in verse 15, where Jesus says, If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother. But if he does not listen, take one or two others along with you that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. You know, this is what the early Christians took and did. Uh, We know this. If you go over to 1 Corinthians chapter 5, you have the very famous example of this with the man who took his his father's widow uh, as his own wife. And that was scandalous even by secular Corinthian standards at the time. And so Paul yells at the church. He doesn't yell at the man in sin. He yells at the church at Corinth. And he says, what are you doing? You should throw this person out of the church. You know, expel the wicked man from among you, he quotes the Pentateuch uh, a number of times. Because what's happening when you have a situation like that going on, you have a kind of leaking bucket in your church. 
you put people in, it appears, but the spiritual reality is not there. Uh, I pastor a church in the middle of Washington, D.C. Uh, we were founded 140 years ago last week. Uh, last week was our 140th birthday as a congregation. And we have, have grown with the city and then kind of shrank in the middle of the 20th century like so many other churches did in the middle of the city as people moved out to the suburbs. But when I got there in 1994, by God's grace, slowly but surely, this elderly congregation, the members were about 130 people coming. They were mainly in their 70s, 80s, and 90s. Uh, at, at one point, if you went out that door, Homer, who was 94, would open the door for you. Back there, uh, it was Alvin. He would open the door for you. He was like 94. Uh, and over here was Charlie, who was 99. And, uh, you know, sweet brother, missed his dear widow, his, his departed wife, super sweet guy, did his funeral when he was like 104. Uh, and I hope he was saved. But, um, you know, <laughs> they were, they've been members of the church since the 1920s, 30s, and 40s. And that's just what our church was. Our church literally smelled like old people. And it was, it was, it was not the kind of place that it was easy to invite somebody in there who was a young person in their 40s, you know, uh, let alone somebody who's in their 30s or 20s. Uh, but slowly but surely, our church began to change. And people began to come who were younger. If you come to our church these days, you know, I, I was 32 when I came to the church, so I was the age of the grandchildren of the people I was preaching to. Now, I'm quite literally the age of the parents or grandparents of the people that I'm preaching to. We've had a huge switch in generation. Everybody sitting there is in their 20s or early 30s. Uh, that's just what the congregation looks like these days. Uh, and there are pros and cons with that. There are many days when I would love to have that old congregation back. But anyway, uh, they knew the word. They loved the Lord. Um, anyway, uh, if, if we understand that the, the Lord builds his church, then we can be patient and we can see it begin to grow under a good ministry of the word. Well, our church began to grow numerically. And the local Baptist convention, which I wouldn't say is a real clear convention on the gospel of Jesus Christ. They're pretty clear on Baptist, um, not so much on Jesus. Um, but they appreciated growing numbers. So they asked me if I would speak uh, do a seminar at the local Baptist convention meeting on getting your church off the plateau. And now that was not any negative things about the southwestern part of the U.S. By uh, off the plateau, they meant like a graph of numbers of people coming. And of course, if there had been another church in D.C. that was on the plateau, that would have been viewed as hugely successful because their churches were all like diving in the number of people attending. A plateau would be their dream. But by God's grace, our church was actually growing numerically. So I started looking at stuff that my denomination printed. And it was stuff like, uh, got to close the back door and open the front door. And I understand what they mean. They mean do good follow-up and try to make your church more accessible to people. And there's, there's some wisdom in that. But I thought that was kind of common pedestrian wisdom. Everybody knows that. That's kind of common sense stuff. I thought really what they need to do is close the front door and open the back door. They need to make it harder to get in and they need to kick people out. If you really want to see the church grow, you know, start being clear on the gospel of Jesus Christ. Start being clear on what it means to be a Christian. And when people are not repentant of their sins, when they love their sins more than the Savior, don't kick them out that you don't want them to come to church. There's no place I'd rather them be than church. But kick them out of the membership of the church, excommunicate them for their own soul's sake so that they don't die happy and go to hell. That's what a faithful pastor should do according to the Bible. Friends, your church will never do that if you don't teach on church discipline. You must study what the scripture says and teach on them. And that kind of discipline is good for the individual who's disciplined because then maybe the, God will use it to wake them up from their sin. It's good for the other Christians in the church as they see the danger of sin as the Holy Spirit uses, to, uses it to wake them up. It's good for the health of the church as a whole. Can you imagine having a church that really is characterized where it's not unusual to see somebody growing in Christ? Hey, you know, so and so they're really growing a lot lately. Like, that's weird here. But instead, it's really normal that people are growing in Christ. That's what we begin to expect at a church. And it becomes a little more unusual if somebody's not doing very well. We all notice that and we're concerned. 
Discipline is good for the witness of the church. If we want to show people outside what it means to be a Christian, and then we want a church that's reflecting godliness and holiness and sanctification. And supremely, brothers and sisters, it reflects God's holiness. It is good to reflect the truth about God. It's good to not slander him as people who bear his name in a special way. And we live lives of unholiness and unconcerned for our sins. So I think you want to begin to understand and teach and practice church discipline. Now, just a word of warning here, because I find when I speak on this, sometimes pastors have their consciences really pricked. And they go, ooh, I hadn't really stared at Matthew 18. I hadn't stared at 1 Corinthians 5. I think I really need to start doing this. And so they go back to their church, and on Sunday they call out some you know, deacon's son who's in sin, and the whole church blows up and they get fired. Well, I'm not really encouraging you to do that. If you really want to start practicing church discipline, like most of your churches would have done 100 years ago or 150 years ago, if you want to start practicing church discipline, the first thing to do is do not practice church discipline, at least not in this final stage of excommunication. The first thing to do is study the Bible. Understand what the Bible says. Take counsel from others. Teach the Bible to the congregation. So the congregation sees these truths. Often as pastors, we think, oh, you know what? I taught on that, so it's time to obey it. No, 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 no. Your congregation is a lot like your children. You teach them things hundreds of times. And it doesn't exasperate you. It doesn't make you impatient. Because they're a whole lot like you are. Have you noticed how patient the Lord is with us? He, we, we hear the 15th message on, on the glory of Christ, and maybe this time we get a little excited. You know, uh, The third time somebody explains repentance, we begin to understand, oh, so I shouldn't keep doing that. Right. I mean, friends, it's typical of all of us. So what we have to do when we want to see something change in our church, we must patiently and diligently teach God's word to our people. And then when we've done that, we need to do that again. And then when we've done that, we need to do that again. And then we need to basically keep doing that till the Lord calls us home. And what happens, there are times in our church's life when our church is ready for a change in a more obedient direction. Now, particularly with church discipline, I would just caution you that it's not done best without a community having been created in which it is natural to be involved in each other's lives. If it seems strange to really know how each other's doing spiritually and to care for each other, then all of a sudden when you're concerned about Tom's adultery, what's like a lightning bolt out of the sky? You know, why weren't you concerned about Tom when his marriage was failing? Why was it Tom in three good relationships where people could see what was going on with Tom and Linda? I mean, what's, you know, so we need to change the way we understand membership where I realize that my spiritual life is the business of other people. And their spiritual life is my concern. I love them. I pray for them. It doesn't mean we're all in each other's business entirely. I don't mean that. But I do mean most fundamentally and spiritually, we are. The local church in that sense is meant to be a cooperative. It's meant to be where we help each other. I think it's in the context of membership being practiced like that, that discipline then begins to seem very normal. A sixth thing that we want to teach our local churches and that we want to see characterize our local churches, and that would be a concern for promoting discipleship and growth. And friends, you've got to have this if you're going to reintroduce something like discipline. You've got to have growing members, people who more and more are reflecting Christ. Uh, a great series to begin preaching if you want to see this in your congregation it's just grab 2 Peter. Uh, start, start teaching and preaching through 2 Peter chapter 1. I love it right in, uh, well, let me just start with verse 1. Simon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have obtained a faith of equal standing with ours by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ, may grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence, by which he has granted to us his precious and very great promises, 
so that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire. For this very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue, and virtue with knowledge, and knowledge with self-control, and self-control with steadfastness, and steadfastness with godliness, and godliness with brotherly affection, and brotherly affection with love. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For whoever lacks these qualities is so nearsighted that he is blind, having forgotten that he was cleansed from his former sins. Therefore, brothers, be all the more diligent to confirm your calling and election. For if you practice these qualities, you will never fall. For in this way, there will be richly provided for you an entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Friends, in our churches, we want our churches to be marked by this kind of vital concern for the increasing growth of its members. You know, sometimes I'm scared that as pastors, if we have 100 people this week and 120 next week, we're more excited about the 20 additional people than we are about what happened to the 100 from the first week. See, it's those 100 individuals who were there that are really important, not the number 100. And so next week, if we have 120 people, but actually it's 80 of the same people and 40 different people, well, then I want to know what happened to those 20 people who aren't here. God cares about them. It's the individuals he cares about, even if your church has 1,000 people. The point is not the number 1,000. The point is those 1,000 individuals and who they are. Are they growing spiritually? What do they need? How are they doing? That's the kind of care we're meant to give to growth in our local church because God is glorified by growing healthy churches in that sense where the members of the local church are growing and prospering spiritually. Well, I hope that's clear. Let me give you a seventh thing, biblical church leadership. Biblical church leadership you need if the church is going to healthily grow. Let me give you three different aspects of this. Again, uh, to reference Phil's talk this morning, we were thinking about this in Revelation chapter 2 and 3. I don't know what you take the, the angel or the messenger of each local church to be, but Phil alluded to the idea that it's the senior pastor, it's the main preaching pastor in each congregation. I think he's right. I think that's probably what that angel is that uh, Jesus is referring to in those letters he sent to those churches, kind of like he said that Timothy was the senior pastor for a while of the church in Ephesus. So I think there's, there's a normalcy to having one main preaching elder uh, in a local church. I don't think it's wrong for other people to preach, and I don't think you have to have that position. But I would say that there's a reason that's been normal in the history of churches, and it's still normal today. But along with that, I would really like to make sure you're teaching your congregations that in the New Testament anyway, there's a plurality of elders. By that word plurality, I just mean there's more than one. So when you have one preacher, let's say Mark at CHBC, good. I hope what I say is biblical and true. But if I'm going to look at the New Testament for a pattern of a healthy local church, what I see is that every time that word elder, presbyteros, is used, except it's, unless it's describing an office, like in 1 Timothy 3 or Titus 1, it's, it's used in the plural. It's presbyteroi. So it's like the elders of the church, singular, in Ephesus, in Acts chapter 20. The elders of the church, singular, that James refers to in James 5. We could go on and on. Literally every example of a particular church and elders, there's a plurality of elders mentioned. What Titus is supposed to make sure happens in every local church in Crete, according to Titus chapter 1 that Paul wrote. So there is a plurality of elders that you'll see throughout the book of Acts uh, and in Paul's letters that's presumed and so, brother, pastor, I would just encourage you, if you don't have a number of other men who meet the biblical qualifications of elders in your local church, I would tell you that's pretty much goal number one for you in trying to see your church become more healthy and growing spiritually. And then I would just say a, a, another aspect of biblical church leadership is to recognize the responsibility that the whole congregation has. It's striking to me that in Matthew 18, Jesus' final word, if the person isn't repentant, is not tell it to the pastor. It's not even tell it to the elders. It's tell it to the church. 
the ecclesia, the church as a whole has to be involved in this. And it's interesting when Paul is writing to the Corinthian church about the man in sin there in 1 Corinthians 5. He's not writing to the elders. He's writing to the church as a whole. And we know from his second letter to the Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 6, 2 Corinthians 2, 6, he's referring to someone who's repented, who the church had excommunicated. Could be the guy in 1 Corinthians 5, we're not really told. But whoever it is, they've repented, and now Paul's saying, you guys got to let them back in. Very interesting how Paul says this. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 6. For such a one, this punishment by the majority is enough. By the majority. But the word there in Greek is plenum, and it means majority. It's just most, plenum. So it looks like the Corinthian church knew who its members were, and it knew what a majority of its members had done, and that that's how they had acted. Well, how could they do that? There's no voting in the Bible, is there? It says by a majority of their members. Well, Mark, that's just a modern American idea of voting. You're only saying that because you're in America. I can't tell you how many times I've had pastors tell me that. To which I would just go, you know, I would just encourage you to read some ancient history. Learn where we got the idea of democracy from. It was Greek city-states, like um, uh, Corinth, where people voted. That's how they made decisions. It's actually not a strange, enlightenment American idea we're foisting back on the text. It's what you call a New Testament idea, which once you start to see it, you might be surprised how many places you see it. Anyway, you get to decide exactly what you think the Scriptures are teaching about this, but you must be clear in teaching the congregation what responsibility they're taking up in joining the local church. I think when you do this, it encourages the church to take more responsibility for its own spirituality. When you have this plurality of elders, most of whom aren't in the pay of the local church, they stop depending on the staff wrongly. You don't want to teach people to pay people to live the Christian life for them. You want to teach the members of the church that the godly elders should be raised up from their own number. And you want to pray and see those raised up so that your own gifts, pastors, will be rounded out by those others that he's placed in your local body. Let me mention an eighth mark. And again, there's an infinite number of marks we could mention about healthy church. But I think an eighth mark would be a biblical understanding of and practice of prayer. And by prayer, let me give you a very careful theological definition. What I mean is talking to God. Talking to God. It is not more complicated than that. It is talking to God. Now, friends, we can only do this effectively because we are in Christ. God knows what everyone on the planet thinks and says because he's omniscient. But he listens to his children because we are in Christ. Because he listens to us in the beloved. So this is why we see commands so frequently in the New Testament that we as Christians should be praying. So we think about Paul writing to the Thessalonians when he says in 1 Thessalonians 5, 17, rejoice always, pray without ceasing. This should typify our lives and our churches. Or if you go over to Hebrews chapter 10 and you start looking at what the Christians were to do together in Hebrews chapter 10, We see in verse 24, let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. We should meet together regularly, and we know from the New Testament part of what we do when we meet together is we pray. We pray together as a local church. So, Brother pastors, please be teaching your churches to pray. How should we do that? Well, we can make a thousand different observations. Let me quickly make seven about how we should pray and how we should be teaching our churches to pray. Number one, our prayer life together as a church 
should be an outgrowth of our personal prayers in private while we're apart. We're not just interested in a show that we put on together. Rather, we want to see an outgrowth of real spiritual life that we as individuals genuinely in Christ have. Number two, I think we have to know as pastor that some of our practices over time will vary. Maybe when you got there, the older members were committed to the Wednesday evening prayer meeting. Maybe this is just suffocating. But there's nothing in the Bible about a Wednesday evening prayer meeting. Friends, you can meet at some other time and pray. What's imperative is that you meet together to pray. Number three, I think some specific words can be helpful in leading a church well. Can I teach you two of my favorite words in prayer at church? They are we and amen, or amen, however you want to say it. We don't know how it was said originally in Hebrew. Guesses are it's amen. We all get it wrong. But those two words, we and amen, are hugely important for our corporate prayer lives. So when I stand up here, you're not going to hear me pray, God, I just ask you, because you're all closing your mouths and listening. You're all joining in. I'm actually representing all of us before the Lord. So when I'm praying in public, now when I'm in my quiet time, I don't go, Lord, we pray you would give me a good day. I mean, I'm in my quiet time by myself. I pray I. But when I'm leading in public prayer, I say we, because we are all praying together, even if I'm the only one that's leading that and vocalizing it. We pray. Teach people to pray corporately. It will begin to affect how you pray and what you pray about. Use we and our. And tell people when the prayer is done to say amen verbally and out loud or amen. I don't care how you pronounce it. Show that you own that prayer, you know? So when someone has finished praying, I don't care if you're the only one in your church who does it, you just start saying a little bit loudly and obnoxiously, amen. I own that prayer. Yes, that is my prayer too, Lord, until you get a whole congregation of thunderous amens. I had the joy a couple of years ago to be meeting with 300 Chinese pastors in Hong Kong. It was awesome. Several days together, teaching this kind of material, only like nonstop, day after day, with 300 pastors in a tiny room. And man, when we would pray, whenever anybody would finish praying, there was just a tidal wave of, amen. I mean, let's just say that all together. Amen. (laughs) Yes, like that. That was a good one. Wouldn't it be great if you had that every Sunday at your church, where it was clear to all the visitors, whoa, what's, uh, you know. I thought it was just some weird dude up there, but everybody is like into this. Like even the normal person who invited me is saying, amen. You know, I, I think we want to teach people to own those prayers publicly. A fourth thing, I think different kinds of public prayer help a church. I think it's good to have some longer prayers. I think it's good to have some shorter prayers. Uh, I think it's good to have some prayers that you plan out ahead of time. I will sometimes have notes for my prayers. I think it's good for sometimes just to have extemporaneous prayer, uh, where you're just praying, you know, on the moment, Uh, and particularly if you're gifted at being able to lead like that. I think it's good for you pastors to lead in prayer. I think it's really good for other members of the church to lead in prayer. I just think there are different kinds of prayers that accomplish different kinds of work among us in the body that we need to think about. Uh, A fifth thing, longer prayers, particularly let's say at our church, are deliberately planned for Sunday morning and they are directed to three different things. We have a prayer praise where for two to six minutes, some brother is simply gonna lead us in praising God for what he's like. He's not asking for anything. He's just praising God. You are a faithful God. We praise you for how we see your faithfulness in this, 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 this. He's just praising the Lord along with a theme that will fit the passage we're preaching on that day. But then we'll also have a longer prayer of confession where some brother will get up and say, oh God, we want to confess that you have said the truth about us. You have told us not to lie and Too many of us, too often this week, we have lied. Oh, Lord, you've told us not to lust. And, Lord, we confess that too often, too many of us this week have lusted. You've told us that we're to rely on you alone. And, Lord, we confess that some of us have relied on our jobs. 
Some of us have relied on our fitness. Some of us have relied on our money. Some of us have wrongly relied on this church. And then just go through a list of sins, searching the hearts. And at the end of which, just say, Lord, for these and our many other sins, forgive us for Christ's sake. Amen. Don't ask for any sanctification. Don't ask for God to help you. Leave them under the water. Show them the seriousness of the sin. Investigate the heart like a good surgeon. And make the mercy of Christ sweet. Because then after that, we always have a scriptural passage that talks about God's pardon and his mercy in Christ that we just read out. Oh, it's sweet. Sorry, that part always affects me. Third prayer that's going to be longer, and that's one normally I will do or the preacher will do. That's the pastoral prayer. That's our prayer of intercession. And I'll often say, and this will be like five to ten minutes, and I'll often say something like, Brothers and sisters, we have praised God in prayer and in song as we've heard his word read and listened to it. Uh, we praise God as we've confessed our sins, as we have said the truth, that he speaks the truth about us, even in ways we don't like to admit. But we also now praise God by relying on him. He is a good father. He wants to give to us. In Christ's name, let's go and ask and show that he is utterly reliable. And then friends, just pray about everything under the sun. Pray for people's health. Pray for people's jobs. Pray for people's marriages. Pray for people to get saved. Pray for members of your church. Pray for members of the government. Pray for other nations. Pray for other churches. Pray for people who've gone out from you to preach the gospel. Pray for your missionaries. Pray that God sanctify you in particular ways that are talked about in the passage you're going to be preaching on. Just lead the church to pray in Christ's name and to depend upon him. Have longer prayers where you lead your church to do that. The sixth thing I would say about prayer, prayer should not only characterize our public services, but it should characterize all of your meetings. If you have elders meetings, you should be spending time in prayer. If you have staff meetings, you should be spending time in prayer. Your interaction with your members, you should be praying together. And number seven, at our church anyway, we regularly expect people to come to the prayer meeting. So we tell people when they want to join our church, we do expect you to be at the prayer meeting. Let me be clear. Hundreds of our members do not come to the prayer meeting. Um, some of them have good reasons. Some of them don't. The Lord can sort that out. Uh, but I would, by God's grace, I think most of our members do come to our prayer meeting. Uh, and it is a wonderfully rich time for us as a church. Let me just give you a, a ninth thing that you should labor for, for your church's health. And that's a biblical understanding and practice of missions. You know, if you're clear in your local church about the good news of Jesus Christ, uh, and there are so many places we could go for this, you, the Great Commission, of course, at the end of Matthew's gospel. You know, a, a good passage to go to is in, in the book of Acts, uh, Acts chapter 26. If you look at Acts chapter 26, uh, this is where Paul is defending himself before Agrippa, and he recounts what happened to him on the road to Damascus. And he says, he, he quotes Jesus, what Jesus said to him in Acts chapter 26, verse 16. But rise and stand upon your feet, for I have appeared to you for this purpose, to appoint you as a servant and witness to the things in which you have seen me and to those in which I will appear to you, delivering you from your people and from the Gentiles to whom I am sending you, to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. Friends, we want our congregation to know that great truth of the gospel and for that heartbeat of really a culture of evangelism and discipling to result in a healthy sort of launching pad for missions as we try to take the gospel uh, beyond our own community. So in your local church, learn about God's word and God's world. I try to make sure my pastoral prayer, I'm always praying about at least one or two other countries by name. Uh, pray about the spread of the gospel in those other places. Uh, Lord, we pray for your churches in Great Britain today. We pray that they would multiply. Lord, we thank you for faithful preachers of your word in Nigeria. 
Give them courage. Lord, we pray for this pastor and that pastor specifically in South Africa. We pray that you'd bless Tim Cantrell at Antioch Bible Church. We pray you'd bless Clint Archer at Hillcrest Baptist Church in Durban. Uh, pray specifically for work in India and that you know of in China. Uh, be careful and don't out pastors that uh, aren't known by their government. So be careful, you know, how you pray. But pray for gospel work specifically. And plan to make your church increasingly useful in the spread of the gospel. Uh, and be willing to pay to support those who go out for the sake of the name or who can't or shouldn't support themselves. So take members of your staff who can preach and send pastors and others to help establish churches in gospel-needy places. So our own local church, we have an internship program. We try to raise up, see new pastors raised up and trained. Uh, We want to do that with our pastoral staff. We want to do that in our church. And then once you send somebody out, care for them. Continue to stay in touch with them. Visit them. Pray for them. See what they need. Uh, We want to wait for a faithful witness to be well established, and we help those whom we've sent out to endure them. Well, there's much more I could say about this. Uh, Jesus told us that the planter plants, he sows the seed, and then he waits. He waits on the Lord. That's what we want to teach our congregation, that we want to spend our lives as a congregation sowing the seed of the gospel near and far and trusting for there to be a great harvest finally at the end of time. Well, friends, I think these are good vital signs of church health. There's so many more we could talk about. I would just ask you, and this is not for you to answer out loud, but just in your own heart, you know, and you love your own church. According to these signs that I've laid out, is your church healthy? Are these the kinds of things you're seeing in your own church? If any of them are not there in your own church, maybe you've come with somebody else here to the conference. Are there, are there conversations you could have with them, time you could spend in prayer? Skip my session. I'm preaching tomorrow. Just skip that session. Just go pray. Just grab some of the other staff members and go pray and figure out what you could do to help your local church with one of these specific areas of health that you think you may be lacking in. 